Welcome to our workshop. This is part of a chair repair series where I'm showing you different styles of chairs and how to repair them. This is an upholstered chair. The previous video I showed you an upholstered seat that would come off and how to repair the chair. In this one, the upholstery is integrated with the chair seat itself. So I've got a break in the chair right here, some loose parts and some loose joints. The only way I can fix this is to take the chair all apart and that means taking the upholstery off. I'm going to cover off reupholstering the chair in a future video. In this one, I'm going to take this chair apart, put it back together to make it rock solid. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. What I need to do is take that apart, repair it, and put it back together so I can get this chair in working order. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. To pull out these tacks, I typically use a putty knife to get in here and just loosen them up. The technique I use is put the corner in here and then slide it underneath to give some leverage to pull that up. And what I'm doing is just loosening these. I can't pull them out all the way with this. And then I come back with a flat screwdriver, put it in the side, and then just pull it out. With all the decorative tacks off the front, I can now turn it upside down and work on the tacks underneath. To pull out these fabric tacks here, just take a putty knife and put it underneath. And it's just a matter of prying up. Most of the time they come out, sometimes the fabric rips. You can see some black fabric here. This is uh, the dust cover that normally goes across the bottom of a chair. Uh, someone's previously taken that off. It's deteriorated pretty well. And these tacks are very small. Just be careful. I'll put it here so you can see it. Just be careful you don't drop those on the floor because if they stand up, you can easily step on them. All the tacks are out now so I can stand this back upright again. Now we can peel back the fabric and see what's underneath. Looks like we've got the cover and the webbing to take off. So take these off the same way. Just put the putty knife underneath and work the tacks out. see what's underneath here. So here's the seat cushion. Oh. And there's some straw here. And looks like a bit of horse hair as well. And then we've got the edge roll here to take off. So a bit more work to go. Now I can take all of this off. So this is cotton, um, just old fashioned cotton. Um, you've got to be careful underneath here with horsehair because some people have some strong allergies to it. So you want to decide whether you want to put that back on when you recover it. Um, some people might just throw it out. So under here we have some burlap. So that comes off in one layer. And then the webbing is also some burlap. So that's going to come out. We'll throw that away. And then this edge roll should just pop off. And we'll hang on to that because we might be able to reuse that. So this stuff's fairly easy to take off. It just comes up. And then we're stripped down to the frame of the chair. With all the upholstery off, you can now see the structure of the chair. So to deal with the break here and this gap and these gaps here, uh, on the corner of miters here, there's a dowel that goes across. So for me to take this apart, this has to separate this way, this has to separate this way, this has to separate and come back together. So I actually have to take these back pieces here and take them apart. So that means I'm taking apart the whole chair, but I need to anyway. This is a, a rickety rocky chair 
and that's what happens with older chairs. Glue joints here will end up failing over time. Glue might last 30, 40 years, and after that, you need to take the joint apart, re-glue it, and put it back together. So we're going to make this rock solid. The first thing I'm going to do is take out these corner blocks here. Now, I can tell this is an older chair because of the upholstery that was in it having horse hair. Uh, there was no foam sponge up until about the 50s. So it predates that. Because there weren't any staples, that makes it older as well because staples were invented, I think, around the 30s and 40s. Um, the other thing that's giving me a hint here is the screws. These are Robertson screws, square drive screws. And we've been having these screws in, in the industry for, I think it was the early 1900s, they were invented in Canada. Um, they typically are red Robertson tips, but these ones are actually the black. So it's a different size, and it's very abnormal for these screws. And the shape of the screw is odd as well, which is telling me that these are very old screws. So that's looking like an old screw for a couple reasons. One reason this is an older screw is because of the shank here is as wide as the threads. On modern screws, the shank is the same dimension here in the threads, the width, as it is up here. So this is telling me it's an older screw. The other thing I find interesting too is, you see the scratch pattern on the top here? The lines go that way, and over here they go this way. Let me see if I can get that in the light. And then they come down this way. So it looks like this was probably ground down by hand when it was made. So it's a very old screw, definitely a very old chair. So based on the screws and the upholstery, I'm guessing this is probably from the 1920s to 1940s. The screws in these corner blocks are the only mechanical joints. Everything else is held together by glue. So we can now take this apart. Some of the joints in this chair are already separated. You can see just a light bit of pressure here. The stretcher comes right out. And here's another spot, the front leg. Just by pushing this back and forth, you can see how loose that is. With the chair upside down, I use my labels here to mark my legs and the stretcher parts. So I've got left front, left, um, front right here, and then right. And then this is an H stretcher. I also label this one in case I need to take it apart. So if you are new to this, I recommend labeling every single part but I've done this enough, I know where the rest of these go. The last thing you want is to struggle with putting this back together when you've got glue on the joints and you're pressured to get it all under clamps. To take these pieces apart, I use a spreader clamp. So this is a quick grip clamp that allows you to take the end off here and put it on over here. And now it acts to spread things apart instead of clamp them. So as I push here, it forces these joints apart, nice and gentle, because the last thing you want to do is hit them with a mallet and potentially break some dowels. So here you can see how it's separating. I come over to the other side and do the same thing. I stretch these. So what I'm doing is I'm separating the front section from the back section, taking it apart this way. Once that's apart, then I can deal with the front and I can deal with the back. So let's see how this comes apart. Yep, it's coming apart well. The stretcher needs to come apart here. Okay, so that's separated. I come back over here to do this side. And there we go. Sometimes joints like this, they come apart, but they're still stubborn. So you can see here, the top is moving, 
but the bottom isn't. I use a wedge for this. So I spread this joint as far as it'll go, put the wedge in, and then pull it, and then work that back and forth, and that gets the joint apart. So these are the front legs. I can now take these apart same way, just using the spreader clamp. Now what happens here is the clamp wants to flare the legs, so by pulling here, you're actually separating this part up here. So again, push this, the legs go out, pull this, it pulls that back in again. So it's just a matter of working back and forth to get that joint to separate. Just like that. If you've got a joint where you try and push it back and forth here and there's no play in it, then that's a lock joint, just leave that. In this one, I've got a little bit of play, so I need to take that apart to re-glue it. And it doesn't want to come apart just by pulling it. So one way to do it is to use a chisel and put it in the joint and try and drive it apart. Okay, so it's separated a bit there. Put the wedge in. Okay, I'm starting to get there, but it's taking a lot of physical work. There's an easier way to do this. Now for the H-stretcher, to use spreader clamps, you have to be careful. Because as I push this apart, it wants to go this way, and I could end up snapping these joints. So. I use two clamps, one on either side, and gently work apart each side a little bit at a time so I can spread them apart. This one's another tight joint, so I'm going to put that in the vise. If I were to use a mallet here, because this is on an angle, it would snap that joint. So all I'm doing is using the weight of the bench to hold this in place while I gently rock it back and forth to pull that apart. And it is coming slowly, but it's better to be gentle than to break it. There, so it's apart. Now it's time for the back. With this already broken, and this loose, and these joints moving quite freely, I can get this top part apart, but this part is pretty stable. So I'm going to concentrate on taking this apart, and I think the rest should just go. This joint here is barely coming apart, so I'm going to put some vinegar in here, let it sit for a while, and then come back, and that should loosen up the glue. Here the joint's opening up. I'm just going to add more vinegar to let that soak in more. Now I can see daylight between this joint here, but it's still not coming apart. So I'm going to have to change tactics and use some heat. This part here is connected to a joint here that's a little bit loose, so it's starting to come apart. So that's apart now. And then these corner joints, they're loose as well. So 
It's just a matter of pulling them apart. And just to show you how the glue is giving away on this chair, this is a joint here, and I can just pull it apart. Okay, so the chair is fully apart now. So what I need to do is concentrate on this brick right here. So if I look at it closely, this is just a flat piece of wood. So this would have been two pieces of wood laminated together. So it's not actually a break in the grain. It's just a glue failure. Now if you look at this closely, I don't see any shine here that indicates glue. If I look on this side, I do. There's a bit of a shine. Let's see if I can get that in the light. That shine there indicates glue. So what I'm thinking here is when this was glued together, glue was applied to this side, but not to this side. So when they came together, that joint was glue starved and that didn't adhere. Now, there's a matching one of these on the other side of the chair here, this line right here, and this one's held. So I'm thinking it was a mistake in gluing. That's why I always make sure that when I glue things, I put glue on both surfaces and then mate them together and clamp them. Now for me to clamp this properly, I can't just put a clamp on here because it will slide. I need pressure that's perpendicular to this joint, so this way. In order to do that, I need to create a call on this side and this side to be able to clamp those together. I've got a separate video on this, it's called vector clamping. I'll leave a link in the description below. So I'm loading up the joint. I've already got the one down here done. You can see here just how I'm spreading the glue to make sure I've got glue on every part of that joint. It's really important. If you don't get glue on every part, you're not maximizing the strength of that joint. I've got a plastic sheet down here to protect it from adhering to my base. This glue joint is dried now here, so I can take off the clamps. You can see here how it's handy to have a variety of clamps. So it's a matter of just cleaning up that glue now. And that's just uh, water based, so a little bit of warm water will clean that right up. With this brake now fixed, these parts are almost ready to go together. I just need to clean off the joints, the mortise and tenons, to make sure there's no glue in them. Then I'm going to use liquid high glue to put this chair together. Now I use high glue when I'm repairing antiques, and that's because it's a reversible glue, and you've seen me do that here. It's reversible in that you can put vinegar on it or warm heat, and that will release the joint. In antiques, if there's a break in the future where a piece of wood needs to be replaced, that way you can take the chair apart and then you can put it back together again. So it's important to use this to preserve the value of the antiques. I use six different glues in my wood shop. I've got a separate video on that and why I use each type of glue. I'll leave a link below. Let's get this chair put together. A glue up is fairly straightforward if you've got all your parts laid out and ready to go. I use the back of an artist's brush to get in the mortises, the holes, to make sure I've got full glue coverage on all the surfaces. I also use the artist's brush to make sure I've got glue on all the dowels as well.
It's important you've got glue on all surfaces to make sure you've got strong joints. Assembling this chair back took a fair bit of patience to get all the parts lined up, but it really came together well. The glue on the back is now dried, and on the front I've glued this as well. Now one thing you'll notice is I struggled with the glue when I was working on this back, and it's because there's a working temperature for this. In the winter time, it just snowed outside, and my shop is about 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and the working temperature for this has to be above 50. So it was right on the edge there. So what I've done is uh, just brought this in the house, let it warm up so it's room temperature, and now I can finish gluing the rest of the chair. Now you notice I put this weight on top here. This is about 60 pounds of weight. I do that to settle down the chair and make sure that the legs are all level. That way after the glue up, I don't end up having to trim a leg. So the last part here is putting in the corner blocks. So I'll do that while the chair is still wet, snug it all together the way it was built in the first place. The last thing to do is clean out this glue squeeze out. This is actually good to have to make sure you've got enough glue in the joint. You just clean it out with paper towel and some water. The glue's all dried in this chair, so what are the next steps? Well, we'll take a look at it, but before I do, uh, we want to reupholster the top here. And unfortunately, the customer wants to try this herself, so I can't take this to the upholstery shop and show you that. But I will take you over to and introduce you to Darren in his upholstery shop to show you how to upholster a chair similar to this. That way it gives you an idea of what you can do to repair a chair like this and upholster it as well. Let's take a look at how this turned out. So the chair is certainly rock solid. That's what we're looking for in the first place. And the seams here, these joints, have come together pretty well. You can see how well this joint came together here and down here was where the break was. There's just a little tiny piece right there I need to touch up with finish, and we're good to go. I hope this video gives you an idea of how you can repair a chair like this. We're building a supportive community around furniture repairs to show other people how they can do the same thing. If you'd like to subscribe, click over here on this icon and click on the bell icon to get notified every time we release a video. Thanks for watching Fixing Furniture.